you have millions of people following your little stupid award. Not a very fancy business, nothing Elon Musk-like. Let's find a way to get rid of you. What are your five keys to success? I really like my job. I mean, startup is like your baby. I mean, that's tough. You have no chance. Sometimes you also act as an investor. That's the hot shit right now. You once told me you started uh, with online marketing rock stars just because you missed something like Omar in the online marketing world. It was, I believe, during a lunch or something. Um, did you expect the growth and the impact Omar had like today? And what do you believe su supported the growth of Omar um, in the past years, growing from 130 to 40K? Um, I mean, I never believed that uh, we could have an event that has uh, 40,000 visitors and uh, that I can ha run a podcast, a weekly podcast that like f almost 40,000 people now like to listen to. Um, in the very d early days, that was my hobby. I, I just liked to go to conferences um, that like, like OMR, except that it wasn't there at the time. So I wanted to, like, you know, as a hobby, build a conference. It's a media product. I, I started my career in media. Then I drifted into technology and marketing, and I wanted to do something in media again. So I invented this, this conference, uh, and it was, a, was just a fun project. And um, over the years, I noticed there's a lot of interest, and then people ask, like, oh, that's so, so sad. It's over now. I have to wait a year for the next conference. Can't you do something throughout the year? And so I thought maybe we can come up with ideas. And then um, since I'm just a, a, a media a content lover, I really love media, content, journalism. So I decided to hire an, an editor and start a small blog. And from then it started and it grew further and further. Um, and now it's, it's huge. And, and along the way, we get a lot of help. I mean, it's the, the reason why we are so big is not because we are doing an incredible job. I think we're good doing a very solid job. But the thing that really helped us is the general trend. It's um, when I first started like SEO, you know, SEO was like, a very niche thing. There was like very few people that knew how SEO worked. They were treated as gurus. They were like, whoa, he knows SEO. Wow, he needs to be real. He he's probably rich. And he I mean, like, I, I, I worked at a publishing house. Like the CEO was um, uh, welcoming SEO guys. Like they were like some kind of, you know, different species only because they supposedly knew something about the search engine. And that has changed. Now this whole industry is in the middle of society. Everybody discusses what's going on on Facebook. Now Facebook has become a topic for everybody. My, 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 um, my father, that, who is 74 years old, he comes up to me and asks me about like Facebook and data and if he's certain and if he should inv invest into Bitcoin. Like this whole digital movement and that started with, with, the, with, the, with the, like search and, and, and Google maybe at the forefront has moved into the center of society. And um, we at OMR, we're just part of the ride. We like were dragged with this movement. There was a huge wave, and we are surfing this wave. And all of a sudden, I'm at Markus Lanz. I'm talking to philosophers. I'm, I don't know. I just met Sasha, who asked me about a startup idea. Um, it's weird. Like he, He's the musician. He's the rock star. And, and now he's asking me about like a startup idea that a friend of his has. Um, so that shows a little bit how things have changed. And it's not because we at OMR, I'm personally very smart. I'm, I'm disciplined. I hustle. I work a lot. But um, it's a general movement, and I'm happy that it, I'm catching this wave. And I mean, it turned out pretty well, right? So, um, and as I assume that you also meet a lot of extraordinary speakers you have already at, at OMR and will have in the future. Um, I assume there are also a lot of things happening behind the curtains. Could you maybe just share one of the craziest or funniest moments you had uh, with one of your guests? Um, I mean, it's 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 really surprising how um, like famous people still irritate like relevant and grown-up people that run businesses. For instance, we had the founder of Metallica, Lars Ulrich, at the festival a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, it's it, he's a very cool guy, very interesting guy, very successful guy, but you have no idea how many people wrote me and asked me, hey, Philip, can you personally take care of me getting a picture with Lars Ulrich, me having meeting Lars Ulrich, shaking his hand? I had no idea the CEOs of companies with a couple hundred employees 
that have nothing else to do but care about their personal picture with Lars Ulrich. It's that is that is really amazing and always shocking. And uh, I mean, that's how the world works. People like selfies and they want to be in, in the company of successful people. But it's really amazing to see. The second thing is, I think three years ago we had Straßenbande. I'm not, I'm not sure. Like those of you who are not from Hamburg, who are not German. Maybe you don't know what Straßenbande is. Straßenbande is like the most famous German rap crew um, in the nation. They're based in Hamburg. They're, they're incredibly successful uh, on, at, at YouTube. Um, they are like, I don't know, Drake, certain Drake, Drake level uh, in, in Germany. And we had them two and a half, three years ago. And it's, it's, it's just wild how, th how they are. I mean, I, I'm, they destroyed our bathroom. Um, they really like, I don't know, were completely loose. They had no idea of um, how this whole thing works three years ago, and they were just getting drunk and, 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 and doing, I don't know, whatever they did. Um, and all of a sudden, the, the whole room was broken and stuff, and now they are that huge. To like follow their path is, is interesting. Then maybe like seeing how, how very basic industry people, like, like a Gary Vaynerchuk, how they managed to develop from a regular guy that's running a startup into a world famous brand. I mean a guy that has nothing but a wine store and a social media agency is all of a sudden a global celebrity that sits in talk shows with Gwyneth Paltrow and, and is, is a star. People want to take their picture and, and we are, sometimes it just feels like at a TV show with, a, with all these um, musicians and artists and then I like one one very funny story is two years ago we had um, the founder of Iron Maiden also as a as a speaker not as a not as Iron Maiden but as a speaker and um, my very good friend Bo another German rapper that I'm friends with and Bo later told me after the event that he's sat like backstage next in our backstage room next to an older guy that had like a strange suit on and so they started talking and talking for a while and then um, uh, the guy asked him so why are you here and and Bo said, like, I'm, I'm going to perform in a little bit, and, and that's my job here. And then Bo asked that guy, so, so why are you here? And then he said, um, I'm, 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 I'm a speaker. And then Bo asked, okay, well what's, what's your company? What do you do? And he said, um, I founded, I run Iron Maiden. And <laughs> Bo was like, what the <laughs> fuck? Um, so, so there's a lot of, like, funny moments, and we, and we bring together people. And, you know, it's such amazing, like, just bringing people together. Another story is the founder of a facelift. Um, the facelift is, a, is one of the bigger, most successful, more successful um, startups coming out of Hamburg in the past years. A um, couple hundred uh, employees, uh, software as a service company, facelift. So the founder spoke at our event, and um, he said, like, I had a good t afterwards. I talked to him, and, like, how did you like it? How was it? And he said, like, I had a very good time. I met an old friend, and I said, okay, who do you meet? Like in the backstage room, I met um, Philip, who is the founder of Deichkind, an, an, an artist. And so they were like, they went to school together and, and did skateboarding and everything. And one of them went on to become Deichkind, and the other one become, went on to, be, to become Facelift. And they met at OMR, and that's the best moment for me. I mean, it's it's amazing what you what you're sharing with us. Thank you for that. Um, you are also one of the experts in Germany when it comes to digital marketing. You talk within your podcast with a lot of other experts. Uh, and last year at the OMR Festival, uh, you shared five underestimated marketing channels. Did these change within a year? And do you see some new quick wins right now? I mean, I, 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 I tried to f deliver five new strategies just a couple of weeks ago at OMR. Like every, every year at the festival, I, I do a keynote and I try to come up with new marketing tactics and new strategies that I see that are new, and um, the latest one that, that I that I think is maybe interesting um, is is PR in general. I, I I look at what Elon Musk does and the way he does PR, the way he does th things that are like from a pure business perspective, they're just stupid. Huh? He like shoots cars in the universe, like this Tesla thing where he like build it, uh, he put a Tesla car that costs I don't know a hundred thousand. Dollars, he put that on a rocket ship and send it supposedly to Mars, so that so that the people from outer space can talk to or can can discover the Tesla, and then he puts some music in the Tesla from David Bowie's Space Oddity, and and it, it, it 
just a crazy story. And um, it makes no sense. There is no outer space where people live. And, and nobody's going to find a Tesla there. It's just a bullshit news. But it was picked up by newspapers all over the world. And I just noticed that if you do something that's really absurd, that's really like completely strange, you get a huge echo, um, especially in the digital uh, space, and you don't need to pay. And so I, I see that a lot, and I think it's something that everybody, even startup founders, can consider. Just do something that people don't expect. Be very generous. Be very strange. Um, and it travels a long way, much longer than it used to in, in the digital universe. So, so that's one thing that I see. Um, obviously, there's a lot of tactics around Instagram. Um, there's, there's um, you know, s marketing tactics from a year ago that I still believe in. I still believe that podcast advertising is, is, is really cheap. Um, that that you can go and on, on, on like a I don't know there's there's podcasts in Germany that just shoot up to 30, 40, 50,000 people that are really like engaged and listening to the podcast, um, and you only have to pay very little money to put your advertising on that podcast. So I think there's tons of ways um, to promote stuff, and yeah, I, I think it's interesting that. Um, what and maybe like if you want to hear more, I have, I have one more example um, that I like to share these days is uh, the, the About You Award. I'm not sure if you know about About You, like the um, Hamburg fashion store. Uh, they, for no reason, they invented an award where influencers receive prizes and awards. And I have a hard time understanding why one influencer is more is better than the other, but that's not even important. The one important thing is there's tons of influencers in the building. And every one of these influencers broadcasts the event to their social media followers. And all of a sudden, you just invent an event that costs you, I don't know, half a million to produce. And you have millions of people following your little stupid award. Um, and it's just free advertising for what you do, in that case, for About You. It's, it's a really smart idea. And there's tons of examples how people do very advanced marketing these days. Awesome. I mean... About You is an amazing example of how it can go. Of course, we had a big budget, but still it's pretty impressive. Yeah. The return we had is millions, so totally crazy. <laughs> um, back to you, actually, as a person. You sold two companies in the past and have built the amazing conference and expo event with a growing impact on the digi digital marketing industry. But usually success is not something which comes from overnight. It comes with failures which usually resu should result in learnings. And I would love to hear your learnings from the past, if you could maybe share one or two with us. Who um, learnings, I mean, I mean, I, g I got really lucky. I, I had um, a good partnership with, with the two other friends that I founded uh, those companies with, and uh, we didn't have like huge setbacks where I was, I don't have that story where I was completely broke, had nothing, and then I, I don't know, I, I, I put my parents' house on the block and uh, risked everything. I honestly don't have that story. I, um, I started out very carefully. I, we started out with doing SEO, like optimizing sites, um, and then making some money off affiliate marketing in the very early days. Um, so I was always, to be honest, striving for, for, for security. And, I, and I I'm not the completely bold visionary that's like risking everything. I was doing it step by step. Um, being careful, seeing that with SEO you make money. Then we did like display arbitrage. We, we sold banners or we bought display banners for, for little price and sold them for a higher price. Not a very fancy business, nothing Elon Musk like, nothing I don't know Elon Musk would ever do. Um, but it gave me some stability and it gave me a very um, reliable business. I knew if I buy that for that price, I can resell it for that price. I didn't even need investors for that. Um, so I try to like, you know, struggle and hustle a little bit and just make the obvious early money and not go for the big, big vision. I, I believe that even like an Uber, even a Facebook, they were not built in the early days to be what we see today as Uber and Facebook. It just happened then that out of, out of a, a limousine or a shuttle service in, in San Francisco, somebody over the years saw the opportunity and developed Uber and out of a like, boy meets girl uh, dating community at Harvard, somebody saw the opportunity and developed Facebook. 
it's I think if you start out with the little things, with like stuff that makes sense, that brings you money in early, or it just solves an obvious problem, then you have to be smart and, and, and realize the potential and then maybe like develop it into something bigger as you go. But I'm always skeptical when somebody approaches me and tells me, look, I have, I'm building the new Facebook. I'm building the new that. That's not how it works. You start like something small and then it grows bigger and on a very uh, like small level, we have seen the same thing with OMR. I just had a like very s small idea, and then I saw the opportunity. I saw that wave, and I saw the chance to surf that wave. And all of a sudden, it's OMR, or you know, like a couple level levels, or like thousands of levels higher. It's Uber. It's Facebook. Um, I know. Start small, and then watch out, and, 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 and try to see the opportunity when it presents itself, and not go too big too early that's that's one advice and if you want to like probably hear my biggest mistake is that this very early days seo site that we built we optimized for um long distance learning and we try to um have that people that were looking to to redo their abitur that have missed the abitur and wanted to 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 go to school to go to university without having abitur we try to catch these people we had a website called studium ohne abi it's a site that's meant to just like be optimized on Google for people without Abitur that want to study. And then that site worked out quite nicely. We made a couple of thousand euros a month from that site after, after a few weeks, after a, a few months. And then I saw the cash and I tried to get more cash. And that was the biggest mistake because if I had stuck with that program or with that website, with, with that idea, I could have probably built a publishing house around long distance education, give like real advice, real Q&A, real comparison between different um, institutes, between di different offers. I could really help like people long term build a publishing house that helps like with people are looking for long term education. Instead, I just built an SEO optimized website that provided some cash for a few months and then Google said, okay, we don't like that. We don't like that thin content. We're gonna kick you out. I could have produced like big and fat content and, and something that, that sticks and stays. Instead, I just did the thin content. That w in, 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 in hindsight, that was a mistake. So what you're saying is invest more time in what you do and also like try different things out, right? Um, yeah, def absolutely. So staying within being having an exit and stuff like that, I would love to hear a little bit more about your second exit, which happened in 2013, uh, if you were years back from now. Uh, back when you sold your real-time bidding uh, startup Metrigo to Xanox, in 2014, the exit was reversed, and, uh, well, you sold it a few months later to some other company, which was Zalando. Uh, how did that happen, and do you also, also maybe have some best practice regarding having exits? Yeah, I mean that you are like pointing at a, at, a, at very difficult days. Um, we we sold uh, the company to Axel to Axel Springer and Zanox, and and the management team at Zanox, which is like the largest affiliate marketplace in in Europe, um, the management team, the management board um, was fired. I think maybe four or five months after our acquisition, they were not fired because of the acquisition, but after the acquisition. And so all of a sudden there was a new management board. There was people from the UK, British guys, very nice, but very straightforward. And they told us, look guys, we haven't purchased you. We haven't acquired you. Um, we don't really believe in what you do. And we, d we think we should put the focus on different things here at Xanox now that we are in charge. Um, let's find a way to get rid of you. And um, so we looked for ways how to get rid of us. And we didn't want to be sold to something else but we still believed in especially our technology. Not so much in the company, but in the technology. And so um, we decided to, to, to repurchase the company and, and the technology. And um, obviously we had like done some research before and, 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 and scanned the market and noticed that there's other companies out there that care about what we do. And so we, we purchased it and then tried and tried. And after a few months, Zalando approached us and um, um, yeah, then they said, look, we need what you do, and then we sold the company to them. Very fortunate turn of, or, or like, e uh, development, uh, turn of events. 
but um, yeah, we we were ha very happy to do this deal, and we had a a very good time with the London. My partner stayed on for almost three years. I stayed on for like a year and a half, and then I I left in in very good spirits because I needed to concentrate more and more on OMR. But um, we had a very good run with them. Awesome. Thank you for sharing for sharing with us these details. Um, do you have some regarding I don't know something we learned from having these exits? What founders should consider if they are planning to have an exit or looking for forward to an amazing exit, whatever. Do you have something you would like to share what we should take care of or something like that? You mean something take care of something in order to get an exit? No more like I mean like you shared, it wasn't like the, the first exit wasn't something you would feel happy with later on. So what can founders do if they are planning to have an exit? How should they take care of, I mean, a startup is like your baby. So how can they make sure that they take care of their baby even if they exit? I mean, that's tough because, I mean, you are not in charge anymore. You, it's not owned by you. You have just you sold it. Um, I, I think ideally you do nothing different than before. I mean, usually the the, the, the acquirer tells you, we want you because of what you do. We want to, like keep you in that position and we, we want you to develop and grow under our our ownership now um, but sometimes it's really difficult because as in our case people have different ideas and and and, and, and want to, sh to shape the company differently um, but ideally you try to like just go on with what you ever did what you did before um, I think it usually is, is tough when the new owner takes over and go tries to go into a different direction, but in the end, there's not nothing that you can really do. I mean, your question, you have no chance. If if someone somebody wants to, um, uh, yeah, do like change the course of the company, what can you do? Got it. So just quickly for you guys, feel free to still ask your questions in a bit. I will just go one after another. So. If you want to make sure that some of these questions are asked, also feel free to vote them up because this is something you can do. So if you like one question which is already in there, feel free to vote them up. Um, back to you. Sometimes you also act as an investor. Um, what kind of startups could you could catch your attention, and how do you decide if you should invest? I well right now I'm I'm not doing investments at all anymore. I, I try to do like five or six investments in the past, I don't know, six, seven years, and they all failed. Uh, I, I made no money, I just lost a lot of money, I lost a lot of time, I um, made some good connections, I, I learned some things, obviously, but for me, the insight is either you go all in and you m make tons of investments and really like, like live the professional business angel life or like investor life, or you don't do it. That's my case. Um, I don't know. I, d I never found the right setup. I, d I know there's some people in Berlin. I have some friends in Berlin and and across the country that that had successful business angel investments, um, but it's it's very rare. Usually, then they are now they are professional or they have like some kind of very specific business angel setup. They have like some some investment consortium or, or, or friendship or partnership, but it's really difficult for like a somebody that's like running his own company to structurally and, and systematically do business angel investments that work out. I have made the experience that it doesn't work out and so I, I'd rather, I don't know, go on vacation or, or work uh, like in my real company. <laughs> Got it. All right, so back to you guys. You already voted some of the questions up. I will just keep one of them for myself. Where is the pizza? Uh, I believe the pizza will arrive in a bit and after this talk you will have some pizza, pizza some beers. And hopefully also as ask your personal questions still also uh, in a private conversation to Philip. Um, one of the biggest questions here is the book that changed your mindset. The book? The book that changed your mindset, yeah. I think there's, there's not one single book that I read that totally changed my mindset. It's, 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 a, it's a long list of books that I've read throughout the, I don't know, past... 15, 20 years that have changed my mindset a little bit. Um, I'm still impressed with like very classic books. I, I, I know there's you probably expect like this business book recommendation. Um, I don't know the Tim Ferriss, whatever books of this world, 
but I think the like the most uh, impressive book that also tells like a business story is like si something like very traditional, something like classic, as like Thomas Mann, uh, Buddenbrocks. I don't know if you know the the, the story of the history of the Buddenbrock family. Um, that's that, that's that's told in a um, t very famous Thomas Mann uh, book. That's that's the book that I read, and and I still like draw stuff from that book. Not so much like everyday advice, but like just a general gut feeling for things and stuff to watch out for and be careful of and um, just very fundamental emotions and, and, and human behavior. Um, you can draw that from very classic books. I don't even think you need to like read startup books, like read one or two or three and read like one or two or three self-help books. That's definitely makes sense. And I don't know, um, there's, there's a lot of self-help books out there that that help um, mm. a little bit, a little bit, but I think the real, the real um, jackpot is to read classic literature um, once in a while, if once you can afford it, when you have the time on vacation, and that's not too difficult. Thomas Mann, for instance, is a lot of fun if you uh, take the time. It's not that difficult, um, and it tells you a lot, even about um, uh, business. Got it. Awesome. So, what's the most profitable social media platform? Is the next question here. The most profitable social media platform. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I g is there so is there is there one that's relevant next to Snap and Instagram and Facebook? I think Snap is not very profitable. Musically, it's not very profitable. So it's I would guess it's probably right now it's probably Facebook. Huh? I believe so too. So. Do you think Snapchat will lose against Instagram stories? I believe you nearly answered the question. Yeah, I, I think um, Snap will find its place and it will sort of be like in a Twitter-like situation uh, for a while. Um, but Instagram is, is probably like already past that and is, is growing faster and, and has probably like a, a little easier positioning right now. Next question over here is, what do you think about voice assistants? The role will they play in marketing and brand uh, branding specifically? I believe it was also a big part of the OMR conference this year. Yeah, there were a couple of speakers on, on, on voice, and I think it's, 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 it's definitely a, a, a huge topic in marketing. I noticed it's not a conference talk topic where we like discuss and, and play some inside baseball around voice. It's something that's really happening in real life. Like people talk like that, you know, like that, into their cell phones, standing like that. You know, I talk to my car when I sometimes use a car. I, I I tell the car like what address I want to go to. You really notice it's it happening. I, I still don't feel like really happy with having Alexa at my house. That's I feel like it it, it listens to too many things that I don't want it to listen to. But still, um, I you sometimes use it. I feel like that technology is, is going to be there in some way. And it's probably going to change marketing. And there's all these stories of how, like, with Alexa, if you want to order from Amazon, Amazon is only going to send you the products that that they have. Um, so, so there's probably some some truth to that, or some developments coming up. But I think it's really early, early days, obviously. But but vo voice is is here to stay, and voice is not going to be Google Glass. I mean, I believe, too, that it's something which is coming. I mean, even Google is preparing a lot of data regarding voice, right? So like structuring and, and stuff like that. Uh, next question here is, who is your biggest idol and why? My biggest idol? Uh, who? Um, when I was like 22, 23, I really wanted to be a journalist. My, my idol or my somebody that I looked up to was the founder of, of Wallpaper magazine at the time, the founder of Monocle magazine. His name is Tyler Brulé. He was a magazine founder and a very interesting guy. Uh, used to be a war journalist before that. Um, so he's interesting. Today, obviously, I look at what a Scott Galloway does. Scott Galloway, that marketing professor that shares a lot of personal things with, with his audience, um, has a lot of very controversial topics. Um, I like to listen to him. I like to follow what he does. Um, I, uh, I sort of like follow what Gary Vaynerchuk does because it's just interesting for, for, for my job, for my profession. But I wouldn't go as far as calling him an idol. That's too much. <laughs> I mean, an idol is, is probably um, 
I don't know. I uh, right now I I I I I'm almost I'm 39 now. I I I just speak to people that are older than me that are like 50, 60, 70, and I I try to find out how they manage to like keep up relationships over 30, 40 years. That's the questions I have. I'm not. I don't have the question of how do you build a company. I mean, I obviously you can learn that from Jeff Bezos. He's really good at that. I mean, he writes about it in his shareholder letter every once in a while, so that makes sense to follow. But the questions I have, regular people in Germany can answer these questions. I, I, I ask myself, how does somebody manage to hold up a relationship for 30, 40 years? Now that I'm 39, that's the question I have. I mean, having a relationship for five or 10 years is easier than having it for 30 or 40 years. Now I look at that and I'm like, that's, that's, people can tell me that they don't need to be famous, they don't need to be entrepreneurs, they just need to have like a, for instance, as one example, a very healthy relationship for, for, for 30 years. Got it, hopefully it's answered. Robert is asking, what are your five keys to success? Well, uh, I mean, I, I'm not that self-help and motivational expert. I'm, I'm, I see myself as an entrepreneur, as a marketing guy, as somebody that now is sort of like drifting into digital topics, um, self-help is, is tough. Um, keys to success, I mean, obviously, you have to put in the work. I mean, it's what Gary Vaynerchuk says the same thing. It's I'm almost sound like him, I don't want to, um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's true, like, put in some work. I don't believe in, like, doing, like, day and night shifts every week and then burning out and doing, like, just, like, I know, try to to make to use regular human judgment. I think it has really helped me to not grow up in Hamburg in the startup ecosystem, but come from like a very uh, general, basic but okay background in, in, in Essen in the Ruhrgebiet, and talk to like a lot of I have a lot of friends there that I used to play soccer with as a kid and as a as a, as a young adult and and like hang out with them and. Just ask them stuff, and th then I tell them, "Look, I'm, I'm planning to, to do this and that," and they say, "Like, are you crazy? Why do you do that?" And it's just something that these really basic insights that put you back on the ground and um, just very you use your very own uh, gut feeling, and don't try to like follow too many uh, so-called keys to success. I, I don't I don't think they are there. If you're just nice to people. It helps. It just—it's so easy. You don't need that as an advice. It's obvious. Yeah? But if you're nice to people, you get that. Usually, you get that back. And if you if you work a lot, usually you get a good output or you get relevant output. I don't believe that has to be a, it, that should be called advice. It's just general observation and gut feeling and insight that people should have, will ha and have. Makes totally sense. Um, next question here in the room is, what would you recommend for a good work-life balance? How do you relax and regenerate? Um, I, it's in the I'm, I'm not a good person to, to give advice on that because I am in the extremely fortunate situation that I really like my job. I mean, I, I told you I'm a content, I'm a journalist, I'm a media-loving person, and now I'm, I'm building a media brand. Orma is a media brand. I, it's really a lot of fun, so I don't... I'm not afraid of, of work-life balance because my work is fun and I get to meet people that are that I through work that are friends and, and I, I can I can really have a, have a good time juggling the two things. It's probably much more difficult if you have like a startup idea if you have the situation where you work on something that is lucrative and makes sense from a business perspective, but is not fun to you. Then you're getting into trouble and you have to ask that question. For me. I don't know. I I I like my job. Sometimes, obviously, I, I try to turn the cell phone off and and I don't hang out with my kids, um, or like work out and, and and go run and and these things. But I don't know. I and I never have the feeling that I'm burned out. Sometimes I have the feeling that I I need a little break, but that doesn't usually last longer than I don't know a day or two. God, this makes this totally sense. I mean, if you're passionate about what you do. But it's not the regular situation. I mean, I, yeah. I can't recommend that because I totally understand that you have jobs and you have good uh, business. I, like the first two companies that I, w that I told you about, that display arbitrage, um, selling banners for more than you acquired them for. Like It's like selling used cars. It's, it's, it's a business. It's not 
what you've always wanted to do. It, I saw that as a business opportunity, and it was my work. So I really was done. I left the office at eight or nine and said, or seven sometimes or six. That's it. No more display banner business today. <laughs> but with OMR, it's different. I, I like to read what Scott Galloway writes. I like to look around and, 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 and surf to other websites and, 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 and read articles at night sometimes and I don't I listen to a podcast when I brush my teeth I listen to a I don't know a podcast that has to do with, with digital marketing and it doesn't feel like work I mean it's your passion obviously so what do you think about messenger marketing also regarding legal boundaries commercial use of whatsapp and so on and so forth um, yeah it's, it's it's a new big thing right I mean it's coming it's uh, it's probably under um, or it's, it's still like a lot of room for growth, especially it's not a very good advertising channel right now. You can't really um, do much uh, if you want to do paid advertising. What I what I see right now that's a good idea is, is, is to build like groups, build like WhatsApp groups. It makes a lot of sense if you can get people to join your WhatsApp group. That's extremely helpful. It's some type of messenger marketing, I guess. If you can get people to join your Facebook group, that's the hot shit right now. Uh, building groups, building like little communities within like messenger apps, that's really helpful. But it's probably the only thing you can do right now because you can't really advertise on WhatsApp, obviously. I mean, it makes total sense. So last five questions I will try to, to ask Philip right now. So feel free to take out your phones, vote the most interesting question up. The next question is, you just became cancellor in Germany. What are three things you like to change? I mean, the first thought that comes to my mind is it's, it's, it's such a tough job to be cancellor of Germany. I'm really thankful there's like Angela Merkel who does it, who wants to do it, that she's doing it really well, I think. Um, that there's other people that are intelligent that want to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful that I, I don't have to do this job. Um, and then I think the question implies that we need to change so many things here. And I think it's probably worth pointing out that we really live in a very good situation right now. I'm, I'm so happy with how, how things are in Germany in general, I mean, there's obviously always things you can do better, and there's there's unfairness, and and there's um, I don't know problems around technology, and, and and you could like how you can prepare better for the future. But right now, it's 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 a time where there's almost full employment, um, the economy is as strong as ever, um, the company is is on a peak. Everybody is jealous of what we have here in Germany, in Europe, in the U.S. All the smart people want to be like Germany. Um, so I would like take this chance to like point the finger, point your mind to like how good the situation already is, and that like there's probably things you can do better. But I don't know. I would try to tell the people about the situation that we're living in and how thankful and we we all should be for what we have and how we can maybe like just use whatever we have as an opportunity to, to like share and, and, and uh, help other people out a little bit. Um, and, and I think that's, that's what I most, what I, what, what I would be concerned with. Do better PR, do better communication um, to the people. Like everybody's so, so stressed out and so concerned about the country and people like chase other people with like all these right wing arguments. I don't know, and there's, there's, there's some fertile ground for that. And I think it's just wrong. You, you should ha realize how perfect the situation for very, very many people is. And not, not only for me, but for very many people. Um, and I don't know, that's to me, that's more important than finding three things that we should do better. I mean, it's a good answer, actually. Um, Axel, the first row, is asking a question. An what old friend. <laughs> totally. Um, what difference do you see, or differences do you see in the German market? startup scene versus international markets, what's one thing you noticed? Um, I mean, uh, the German startup scene is probably the only startup scene that I really know well, uh, where I know a lot of um, 
players, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, I don't know, um, employees, people that are in that space, journalists, and um, the US startup scene, I'm not so familiar with, so I, I don't really know how it works. What I hear is that in the US, everybody's a little skeptical about, about startups because they say it's, it's really tough to build a new startup against Google, Facebook, Amazon, and all these platforms, and you have to do really like, things that are far away from the consumer internet. And in Germany, I still see a lot of people that are maybe more naive and think that they can actually lo launch apps that will succeed. I think in that aspect, the American startup industry is, is maybe a little more um, educated and a little more, I don't know, accepting of what the circumstances are right now. It's really tough to launch a B2C a consumer business. And um, in Germany, I don't know, I think it makes sense to to also discover the beauty of B2B businesses, to discover the beauty of stuff that's happening outside from consumer in of consumer internet. Because that's defi definitely a very tough place to be in, in times of, of those four companies. Axel, answer? Awesome. Uh, I hope I pronounced the name right. Marwan is oh. asking... Not an old friend. <laughs> Not an old friend. So, I believe you lo love the question, though. Is it too late to get into podcasting, is the question. Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, right now, podcasting is, is land grab. You have to I don't know, do it now or in the next month or so. It's still new listeners every day, new people like that come into podcasts and that find a podcast and discover the beauty of this medium, of this format. So I think that whole thing keeps on going, for, will keep on going for a while. And I think, for instance, what the guys at Audible are doing is, is really stupid, like having a paywall. Um, so you're producing great content and paying for great content in podcasting right now, and then you're putting it behind a paywall in a world where there's free podcasting, and that's also great. I think right now you have to invest. It's land grab um, times I in podcasting, and it's probably be going to be like that for, for a little longer. The only thing that you have to realize in podcasting is there is no natural discovery. It's not like with websites and where you had search and you optimized and then somebody found your website. Or where with, I don't know, early days with apps where you put your app on Facebook and then people discovered your app through Facebook. For podcasts, there is no real discovery. Podcasts that work usually have um, platforms that they live on. Like Spiegel Online launched a podcast, it works because it comes from Spiegel Online. Um, we did a podcast, my podcast, it works. I probably do a solid job with the podcast, but I'm not the greatest interviewer. But we have all the OMR website that we launched the podcast from that helped a lot. So you need to think about discovery. We have a podcast that talks about soccer and is like a humor podcast that we produced with some friends about soccer. It works not, uh, I mean, it, well one aspect why it works certainly is because the guys that do the podcast have a lot of social reach and they can promote the podcast. So I think if you want to do a podcast, you have to think about where's my discovery, where do I get my reach from outside of the podcast universe? Because as I said, podcasts have no built-in discovery function so as website ha websites had, as apps had, as other things have. So you need to come up with a good solution for that in order to be successful in podcasting. A follow-up question from Robert. What's the best way to start a podcast? Yeah, I think um, look for a partner platform that is willing to distribute your podcast. I mean, or that you can partner with. It's, I mean, uh, it's not that difficult to produce a podcast. You just, you know, talk to somebody, produce an interesting format. That's still possible. But finding, um, finding reach... Finding partners that can provide reach is difficult. Um, and that's wha whatever space you are, you're working in or you're, 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 you're talking about or you're, that's, that's your content, you need to like look around and maybe there's blogs, maybe there's Facebook sites, maybe there's influencers that, they can, that can piggy take you in and piggyback you. Um, I think you need to work on reach. You need to like look at podcasting, not as a content business right now, you need to look at it as a, as a reach business. How can I build reach for my podcast? Um, 
producing good content in that space is easier than creating reach, that's for sure. All right, that's actually a pretty awesome answer. Um, what is the hottest content-driven business model out there is the next question here. Content-driven business model. Um, it's probably Netflix. <laughs> I would guess Netflix is just awesome. I mean, it's, it's, it's if you look at the numbers, they're putting on new subscribers like every quarter. They're growing like crazy. They're investing like billions, billions into content. Um, it's just a very, very solid business model that's self-sustaining. Um, it's an inc insanely valuable company by now. So in the content space, that's probably the strongest content business. And then there's Amazon Video and all these things that's based on other businesses. That's, that's strong because there's Amazon Prime and, and Amazon it itself. But the strongest like standalone content business probably right now is Netflix. All right, last three questions. So feel free to upvote still. Um, this is actually regarding your reason why you came late. What was the what was the most difficult, or what was most difficult to defend about the internet at Lanz? Um I mean, the the general feeling towards the internet or towards digitization is now skepticism and and and, and in, in in the broader public, right? I mean, here in our ecosystem, in our bubble, it's o it's okay. But like my grandmother, my parents, they look at digitization as something that's that's negative, that's that's um, making the world a more problematic place. And if you have that philosopher uh, there that supporting this thought, it's really difficult to push the idea through that we are like um, um, seeing a development of things. It's things are developing, and obviously there's there's setbacks and there's problems, but the the general development is positive. The world is becoming a better place in general, even though there's um, there's journalists that like to point out the negative things because they create more attention and all that. But I think in, in general, like to push the idea through in that very negative um, cloud that we are under right now, um, that the world is is moving in, in the right direction in ma very many aspects. Got it. Um, next question. Is entrepreneurship becoming the new dream profession for young people due to the higher attention in social media through, an example, Gary Vaynerchuk? And is that healthy for our society economy? I, I think that there is probably like, I mean, 20 years ago you wanted to become a rock star and then you will want to become a professional athlete, and today I think there's a lot of people out there that want to become entrepreneurs. Um, thanks to like all these really rich entrepreneurs that, that, that serve as idols, like a Mark Zuckerberg, like a Bezos, like a Gary Vaynerchuk. And I think in general that's very healthy. It's, it's good for the economy if a lot of people try to become entrepreneurs and, and try stuff out. But I think we also, also need to realize that it's probably not for everybody. Um, like rock stardom is not for everybody. Um, professional athletes is not for everybody. It's, it's difficult when it becomes like something you just want to do because you want to live the lifestyle. It shouldn't be about the lifestyle. It should be about the actual thing you want to do. Um, and the lifestyle is very dangerous because, I don't know, it doesn't support you if it doesn't work out. It's, it's very risky. Um, and, and, and at some point you want to make sure that you have money when you're older and, and, and if you just have the startup boy, uh, fanboy lifestyle, it's difficult. Um, but I think it's, it's still a good movement, but it's also very okay, very acceptable to like after trying, you realize, well, selling stuff. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a salesman. Being a salesman, as I said in the beginning, going to lunch, running here, selling your stuff, selling yourself, selling your products, your brand, it's not for everybody. I enjoy doing that, um, but I, I'm really happy there's people out there that are diffi different, that don't enjoy do doing that, um, that strive and live for other stuff. And luckily, entrepreneurship has to do with salesmanship. But if you're not a natural, or if, if you don't want to be a salesman, that's okay, that's absolutely okay, and you can 
be part of the startup ecosystem without that. But as the founder, you probably have to be a salesman or somebody on the founder's team has to be a salesman. And you have to realize or ask yourself, do I want to be that? Do I want to be the guy that sells shit? It's, it's not a job for everybody. It's not a fun job for everybody. Totally true. So next question is probably leading to a small commercial. Uh, where can we follow you for news and strategies? Oh, at OMR. I mean, OMR.com, our podcast, OMR podcast. Um, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter at Westermeyer. Um, I don't know. I spread stuff all, all across all platforms under the OMR umbrella. I mean, the OMR is, is our brand, is, is, is my brand. Um, and, and if you like to read stuff, we publish an article every day. We publish a podcast every week. Um, we do seminars. We call them deep dives every other week. We put out videos. Um, I, I'm really proud. I'm really proud that the video of my keynote at the OMR Festival has now 30,000 views on YouTube. That's huge for a German business video on YouTube. It's not like Straßenbande, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, I don't know, it's 186 million views less. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's still okay for what we do. So that's where we can find me. The next question is, what does your working ru daily routine look like? So when you just wake up, what do you do? And how does your the rest of the day look yeah. like? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not glamorous at all. It's, it's not a routine. I mean, I'm, I'm really envious uh, of, of all these people I listen to, to, to the the podcast and I, I, and I notice there's people that tell me look I get up in the morning I go for a run and I meditate and, and at night I read a journal and and it's I think it all makes a lot of sense and I try to do like be like thankful and take a minute to relax in the morning or at night but the truth is many times if you have kids you know just kids I don't know making noise <laughs> waking you up um and then I don't know, just putting you right into your everyday life, and then I try to I don't know, juggle everything and get the kids to kindergarten, and then l sometimes I just come into the office. I have I don't know five things to do, and at the end of the day, I notice I have not got anything done. Because if you just appear and show up in the office, new stuff happens, new problems arrive, and new troubles and ideas come my way at the office, and I just need to like solve them. And then I find, t on, on good days, I find like an hour or two at night to like take care of the five things that I actually wanted to get done. So it's, it's probably the plight uh, of, of having like more than one or two or three employees. Now I have 60 employees and um, it's a challenge. It's, but it's a lot of fun. I'm not, gonna, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that you can make a lot of plans, but other stuff happens. In the end, I think you need to find your, your free time, time to like, um, work quietly at your desk or think about your stuff but I can think about stuff when I'm riding my bike, when I'm brushing my teeth when I'm, I don't know, um, laying in bed um, when I walk into the office it's, it's not much routine it's just walking around, talking to people and trying to solve problems So last two questions um, first of all you did an Omar podcast live at the El Harmony and back then you said do you know why we're doing that? Because you can't ask for entry for a podcast. More or less, it was like that. Yeah. Um, the question is, do you are planning to do another OMR podcast at the Alpha Harmony or somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's we, we see ourselves as a media brand and we have to do like weird and, and, and unusual things. As a media brand, we have to surprise our community and um, just, I don't know, moving a podcast event into the Elf Philharmonie is, is kind of weird, <laughs> kind of unusual. That's why we did it, and um, um, maybe we do it again. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm not going to do it every month. It's not a business model. It doesn't work as a business model. You have to look at it as a, as a, w as a once in your lifetime event, or maybe like five in your lifetime event. Uh, do it like once a year as a very of a highlight, as, as the big moment of the year. Um, but you can't look at it as a business. So I guess if you get the chance, we'll try it again. But it's it's not going to be a uh, series. Got it. So uh, another question from Robert, and I believe I will just put this question for my before my last question because it's a good one. Are you looking for new employees? Am I looking for new employees? Um, right now we are like 
downsizing a little bit after the festival. I mean, before the we have like a lot of seasonal business um, that that we build up a lot of staff uh, like late last year and then like this spring for like five six months to help us with the festival and now we're like trying to breathe a little bit um, and then we're like rehiring a lot of people for different kinds of jobs um, in the fall but we aside from that seasonal business where we don't really look right now because we have people that we like need to find um, different temporary jobs for the summer for so we're in that position where we need to give away one or two people and try to find them jobs where they can work for half a year and then come back to us. Um, but what we do right now is we try to replicate OMR. It's not public yet, but I, 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 I mean, I, I'd like to share it. It's we think that we can take the idea of OMR, having like a topic and an event business, and try that with a new um, vertical, with a new content topic. We try to do like a finance business OMR thing. It doesn't discuss digital marketing, but discusses the development in finance. And then we try to build a huge finance event around that. And we start that in the summer. In, in July, you'll see our, our, our first website for the, that finance vertical. And once that has started, we probably look for more help with that. Pretty awesome. I mean, you just answered my last question uh, without me asking it. So thank you for your time Paul. thank you for being here i believe you will be around yeah, a little bit yeah, yeah. so people can ask still their question because there are still a lot um so thank you for being here and thank you for all your questions thank you for having me